Thank you. I'll just ask the Reverend Professor Ackroyd to come to the front and to minister God's word to us this evening. Well, good evening, everyone. It's a great privilege to be here and to be able to speak from God's word to us all. My great love is history, because in the events of history, uh, we see so many lessons for life. The year was 1869. David Livingston, it's his bicentenary year, 2013, 200 years ago, he was born in High Blantyre, not, not too far from where we are today. Now, Livingston at that point had been missing, or at least not heard from, for four years. The New York Herald newspaper sent its star reporter, Mr. Stanley, with one express purpose. Spend as much money as you need, but find Livingston. And Stanley went to Africa in search of this great missionary, this great doctor, this great explorer. And after a period of two years searching the continent, you know the story, they meet on the shores of Lake Tanganyika, and Mr. Stanley approaches Dr. Livingston with the now famous introduction, Dr. Livingston, I presume. Two men who had previously not been acquainted had come to know each other. And it was Livingston who replied, I am thankful that I am here to welcome you. This evening, in John's Gospel, John 1, we have an introduction that on first sight might seem to lack all the drama. There's no famous explorer. There's no heightened sense of expectation. You see, the, the journey of Stanley through Africa was being avidly followed on both sides of the Atlantic. And when we come to the gospel account, what we have is we have an account written by a man who we would describe as a member of a, a small businessman. John was part of a family business. Fishing was their business. And he would have been a prosperous, relatively prosperous man. He would have been in the, the middle class in Galilee. And this account is really an introduction for us to someone who would be described as a peasant, someone who had little power, little authority, no property. So you have a fisherman introducing us to a skilled laborer, a carpenter. And you might say, to what effect? So what? Why would we spend time reading an ancient account of a fisherman telling us about a carpenter? But when you actually open up the Bible and when you turn to John chapter 1, you realize that this is no ordinary carpenter. And in fact, the author is no ordinary fisherman. And this account, this introduction, is no ordinary piece of literature because if you've never read the Gospel of John, I would encourage you to take the Bible and to read. 21 chapters, it wouldn't take you long to get through. And you would be introduced to one who is without comparison. One who is remarkable in what he said. Remarkable in what he did. Remarkable in what he claimed. And remarkable in what he accomplished. And with you this evening, I'm simply going to present John's introduction. He introduces his theme. He introduces his subject. And he tells us two remarkable things concerning this man, Jesus. Now, you know what an introduction is like. You, when you introduce yourself, you say something about you, or when you meet somebody, you ask something about them. What's your name? Where are you from? What do you do? My name is Bob, from the United States. I teach. That's who I am. That's where I'm from. That, that, that's what I do. And and that's the basis of an introduction. That's the basis of, of a first conversation. We turn to John's Gospel. We turn to the first verse of the first chapter. And the fisherman answers these primary questions. He answers the when question. He answers the where question. He answers the who question. And he also answers the what question. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things were made through him, and without him was not anything made that was made. In him was life, and that life was the light of men. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. 
when the beginning. The subject of this biography has always existed. He has no start. He has no end. For me, the 13th of October, 1966, was my beginning. That's the day on which I was born. But John is emphasizing that this subject of which he is writing has no start. Because even in the beginning, he was there. And where was he? Well, we're told that he was with God, that he was in glory. This, this term, the Word, which is unique to John in the Bible, he wants us to tell us something about when he was, something about where he was, and then remarkably, something about who he was. And the Word was God. In the beginning, he was, was the Word, the Word was with God, and the Word was God. So Jesus, the subject of this gospel, is introduced to us as none less than God himself. With God in the beginning, in glory. And then, the what? What does he do, or what has he done? We're told that all things were made through him. Without him was not anything made that has been made. And not only has he created but he enlivens, he gives life. In him was life, and the life was the light of men. So when we're introduced to this Jesus, we need to understand something about him. That all that we know about God is true about Jesus. All that we know about Jesus is also true about God, because when you see Jesus, you see God. When you hear the voice of Jesus, you hear the voice of God. When you see the actions of Jesus, you see the actions of God. The power of Jesus, the power of God, the compassion of Jesus, and the compassion of God. There is nothing inconsistent between what we know of Jesus and what we know of God because they are both equally God. God the Father, God the Son, and as you read the book of Acts, you'll read about God the Holy Spirit who came to bring life and to bring new birth to his church. So the first introduction is quite simply this, Jesus is God. But notice at this very first paragraph that there's a conflict, that he is the source of life and light, and yet there is something called darkness. And you see, there is a conflict, not just in the Bible, but a conflict in life. There's a conflict between God and there's a conflict between man. There's a conflict between Jesus and there's a conflict between the world. There is something about God and something about us that does not fit together. Light and darkness, good and evil, purity and sin. And this conflict is brought before us in very sharp focus in just a moment. But let's focus on the introduction again. Jesus is God. We're told that there was a servant who was sent, a man whose name was John. It was a different John. John the Apostle writes the account, but John the Baptist is the one who was preparing the way. He's a signpost. This afternoon, traveling to Sterling, drove up the road. You're driving from Edinburgh. You're driving to Sterling. You need the M9. You just follow the signs. You can't miss it. You see the signs. You see the word, and you go where you're pointed. And that's exactly what John the Baptist came to do. And Christian, if you're a Christian here today, You take this example from the gospel itself and from John the Baptist himself, that if you have already been introduced to Jesus, if you have already met Jesus personally, well then your role, one of the main and primary functions that you have, is in your own way, in your own sphere, among your own friends, your own circle, is to be that signpost, to be that one who introduces or points people in the direction of Jesus. He has done all the work. He has accomplished everything on our behalf. And we have the great privilege and responsibility of pointing people in his direction. So we're introduced to Jesus who is God, but we're also introduced to Jesus who is human. This is a remarkable statement. We see this in John's Gospel in the chapter that we read in verse 14. And the word became flesh and dwelt among us. We have seen his glory, glory as the only Son from the Father, full of grace and truth. 
So all that we know about God is true about Jesus. And yet we see that Jesus Christ became a person. He became a human being. He came down to our level to share in our experience. And quite literally, the word here, flesh, literally means your flesh and blood. And when we're told that he dwelt among us, that means that he moved into our neighborhood. He came to be one of us, to live as one of us, to experience life firsthand. There was an ancient writer. He was living in the fourth century. His name was Hillary. And Hillary put it this way. He said, remaining what he was, he became what he was not. Jesus remained God with all power, all authority, all glory, all honor, and he became something that he was not previously. When Jesus was born, he became a person. He became a man. He became flesh and blood. He experienced life. So he today understands. He knows what you're going through. He knows what you've been through. He understands what lies ahead. He knows the joys of this world. He experienced happiness, celebration. He was at a wedding feast in Cana. He knows sadness. He knows sorrow. He was at the graveside of his friend Lazarus. He knows pain. He knows rejection. He knows disappointment. He knows hunger. He knows thirst. So this evening, we have in Jesus Christ one who is God and one who is human. But this is the challenge because does that mean that he is half God and half human, that he's part, partly God and partly like us. Well, this is the remarkable thing about the Bible, that the Bible says to us that he is completely God and he is completely human. Everything that is true about God is true about Jesus, and everything that is true about us is true about Jesus, but with one striking and startling exception. You see, Jesus was never guilty of doing anything that was wrong. Never guilty of saying anything that was wrong. Never guilty of entertaining a harsh thought or speaking an unkind word. And you see, that's the distinction between him and us. Because we see in him humanity as it was meant to be. Pure, perfect, sinless. God became man. He moved into our neighborhood. And as you read further, and I hope you do read further, if you've never read this book, read this book. You read further into the account, and John the Baptist continues to speak. John the Baptist continues to point. You see, people are focusing their attention on the servant, on the messenger, and John is saying, look, it's not me. What you need to do is to look at him. And in verse 29 of John's gospel, we're told something remarkable. So not only did God become man, but in verse 29 we're told this. The next day he, John, saw Jesus coming toward him and said, Behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Now this is the third and the final part of our introduction, which is the most striking, the most remarkable. Jesus is God, Jesus is human, and Jesus is now described in terms of, as Savior, one who has come to rescue. You see, there's this great, great disconnect between us and the God who created us, between you and me and the God who has given life and given light. You see, we live in darkness. God lives in light. We so often do and say and think things that are wrong, and yet God never does. So when we're told here that John the Baptist now describes Jesus as the Lamb of God, So not only does God become man, but now God is described as lamb. Now, lamb was an animal that was sacrificed. A lamb was an animal that was killed in the place of others. So instead of people, instead of God punishing people, he devised a scheme whereby sin could be temporarily transferred or symbolically transferred that that an animal could be representing people whereby the sin that would otherwise separate people from God. And sin is quite simply this. Anything that isn't true about God, anything that isn't right, anything that isn't good, anything that isn't true, anything that isn't genuine, 
That's what sin is. We're not meant to say. We're not meant to think. We're not meant to do. And we're meant to be a people who are like God in our character, in our nature, in our actions. And at any point when you and God diverge, when your actions and his actions don't fit, your words and his words aren't consistent, that's what sin looks like. It's something you say, it's something you think, it's something you do. And it's also something that you can leave undone. So when we're told, behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world, we realize that there is a disconnect between the world and God. There's a problem that separates the two. And Jesus has come to bridge that gap. Jesus has come to solve that problem. And Jesus has called you and me to recognize who he is, who we are, and to understand what he has accomplished on our behalf. The Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. There was a symbolic ceremony that took place. There were two goats that were chosen. One goat was sacrificed and the blood was shed. And another goat, the priest would put his hands upon the goat That would be described as the scapegoat, the escape goat. And that goat would be sent into the wilderness, symbolically carrying with it the sins of the people. And you see this language that was familiar. John is saying, look at Jesus. Look at him and you will see the one who really takes care of the problem. Look at him. And you'll see the one who really pays the price for what we ourselves have done. The world that God created. The world that God gave life to. This world is in rebellion. This world has turned its back on its maker, its creator, its redeemer. So even in that very first paragraph where we read of light and darkness, John goes on to tell us in verse 9, he says, The true light, which enlightens everyone, was coming into the world. He was in the world, and the world was made through him, yet... The world did not know him. You see, when Mr. Stanley went to Lake Tanganyika, it was quite easy to identify David Livingston. Stanley and Livingston had the same complexion of skin color. So you see, when one Caucasian man sees another Caucasian man in the midst of a large crowd, he put two and two together and said, that must be, that must be the famous Dr. Livingston because he doesn't look like anyone else. It was so obvious, it was so striking, so that's why he could say, Dr. Livingston, I presume. They had never met, but it was obvious. And the Bible says that recognizing God should be obvious. It's obvious who he is. It's obvious what he's like. And yet, the obvious is now hidden. The world, we're told, made through him, and yet the world did not recognize him. Didn't see him, didn't understand, didn't put two and two together. And yet we're told that he came to his own, his own people. And his own people did not receive him. So Jesus came into this world. He didn't come into this world to fanfare and to acclaim, to celebration and to joy. He came into this world of sorrow, this world of sin, this world of darkness. And by and large, this world didn't recognize him, didn't want to know, didn't want to hear. And yet we're told but to all who did. You see, Jesus has come to be recognized, and not just to be recognized, but to be worshipped, not just to be understood, but to be followed. And we're told that to all who did receive him, to those who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God. Receiving Jesus, believing in his name, means that we now become. Remember, Jesus remaining what he was, became what he was not. Through faith in Jesus Christ, we remain who we are. We have the same characters, the same personalities. But faith in Jesus means that we become something that we previously weren't. We become part of a family that we previously were not part of. We become part of a a worldwide fellowship that we previously were not members of. And if you, like me, I, I studied history, but my Probably the subject I was best in in school was math, or maths, if you like, prefer that. In maths, you have an equation, don't you? A plus B equals C. 
Well, the simple equation that John gives us here is it doesn't matter where you're from, it doesn't matter what your background, it doesn't matter how much you know, it doesn't matter what you've, what you've learned along the way, but if you come to that point where you receive Jesus, if you come to that point where you believe in Jesus, then the natural outcome is that you become. So receive plus believe equals become. There's an introduction here. Now, it's a pretty difficult conversation where if you introduce yourself to somebody and the person that you're speaking to doesn't say anything back. My name is Bob. I'm from the United States. I live in Edinburgh and I teach. And you say, that's, that's nice. And then I'll say, well, what's your name? And where are you from? And what do you do? Because... What I'm doing now, this is a monologue. This is not a dialogue. This is me speaking primarily. But I would hope that if I haven't met you, that after the service, when we're sitting talking, that it's not still a monologue, that there's a dialogue. There's me speaking, you responding. You speaking, me responding. That's what we call a conversation. And you see, John is introducing us to Jesus with a response desired. Just like a wedding invitation. I was at a wedding on Friday. I was conducting the wedding, so I guess I had to be there. But you know, all the guests were invited, beautiful handwritten invitations, and at the bottom of each invitation was the simple letters, RSVP, please respond to this invitation. It's a personal invitation, a personal request that requires a personal response. You see, to this evening we have been given a personal introduction from John. He says, I want to tell you about someone. I want to tell you about Jesus who is God, I want to tell you about Jesus who became man, and I want to tell you about Jesus who is now the Savior. And what I want you to do is to receive him personally. I want you to believe in his name, and then you too can become a part of his family. You too can receive all of his benefits, all of his blessings. So this evening we are introduced to Jesus Christ, the Son of God. If you don't yet know him, please come to know him for yourself. And if you do, Commit yourself to pray, commit yourself to serve, commit yourself to witness, and commit yourself to this great undertaking of making Jesus known today in this community, in this city, in this land, wherever God places you. Because there are many people today who have never been introduced to Jesus. And I defy you to be friends with somebody that you've never met. I defy you to have a relationship with someone who's a complete stranger. And it's absolutely impossible, humanly speaking, for anyone to come to know or to believe in Jesus unless someone takes the effort to point them in his direction, to place a Bible in their hands, or to, to tell them about what Jesus means to them. We are introduced to Jesus who is God, who is man, and who is Savior. If you don't yet know him, you can. And if you do know him, have you made it your life desire to see others, your family, your friends, the people you work with, the people you live next door to, that they too can come to know him as well? Let's bow our heads for a moment in prayer. Let's pray. Father, as we commence to serve you in this particular way, as this new initiative has been undertaken, of sharing the gospel, of witnessing to Christ, of worshiping Jesus, we ask, O oh Lord, that you would accomplish more than we ask and more than we imagine, that you would use this gathering of your people to achieve great things in his name. We realize that we live in a country where many do not know, many have not heard. And if they don't know and if they haven't heard, how can they possibly come to know? Enable us to recognize the great responsibility that is ours. Enable us to realize the great privilege that is ours. And enable us to put together our love for Jesus and our love for people. To point them somehow, some way that they too might come to know and to love him too. We thank you above all that Jesus Christ is the son of God. We thank you that Jesus became man, that he has come down to our level. And that this evening Jesus Christ remains the one and the only Savior for men, for women, for boys and girls. And may we come to know him, love him, serve him, and follow him in all the days that you give us here. Looking forward to that one day where he will bring us to be 
with yourself forever. And we pray all in Jesus' name. Amen.